Begin with me in verse 1. Let's read the first five verses of chapter 1. Starts with Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. And he includes with this greeting, Timothy, King James has Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ. And we're going to come back to that, but notice that phrase, in Christ. If you're a highlighter or underliner, the little phrase, in Christ, or in Christ Jesus, or in Christ Jesus the Lord, deserves to be highlighted and noted in your Bible. So he says, the faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, which was their earthly location, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice Paul's thankful heart. And that's, by the way, the title of my message I forgot to mention is Paul's grateful heart or thankful heart. He says, we, whenever he uses the plural there, we, he's including himself and Timothy, no doubt, give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we again heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, of the love which you have to all the saints, and for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, where have you heard before the word of truth, the gospel. A.W. Tozer once said, we do not preach Christ with a comma after his name as though waiting for something else, nor do we preach Christ with a dash after his name as though leading to something else. We preach Christ, period. I love that. So the book of Colossians is preaching Christ, period. Now, one very simple way, but it's not overly simplistic, to view the book of Colossians is that it preaches Christ. That it's one of the most Christ-exalting letters Paul ever penned. Some feel, and I can almost concur, I, I hate to be kind of venturing out too strong on this, that it is the most Christ-exalting epistle in Paul's letters, and some feel even in the scriptures altogether. Now, there are several books of the Bible that stand out for the glories of Christ. The Gospel of John is one, of course, and the book of Hebrews is another. And so Christ is exalted in these books. But this book is all about Christ's preeminence and Christ's sufficiency. Now, let me break down three main themes for the book of Colossians. The first is Christ's preeminence. And I want you to peek at that with me in chapter 1, verse 18. Look down at verse 18. This is a key text for the book. And he that is Christ is the, uh, is the head of the body. Notice it's the focus of Christ, the head of the church, the body of Christ, which is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and then notice at the end of verse 18, that in all things he might have preeminence. Now, the word preeminent means nothing is to be above Christ. Nothing is higher than Christ. Nothing is to be above Christ. Nothing is to be more exalted than Christ. He is above all things, Christ preeminence. So this is one of the main themes. That's one of the key verses to the book of Colossians. And then secondly, Christ's sufficiency is brought out in Colossians. Look at chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Turn to chapter 2 and verses 8 and 9. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him that is Christ, verse 9, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So don't be spoiled by the philosophies and the teachings of men, because in Christ we are complete, which by the way is talking about our sufficiency in Christ, and he is the head of all things. He is the fullness of the full Godhead in bodily form. And then the third point that I would make about the theme of Colossians is in chapter 2, the next verse, verse 10. And you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. So Christ preeminent, chapter 1, verse 18, 
Christ sufficient, chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, and then Christ our completeness. Now, that word complete again, as I said, is a nautical term. It means that you are fully rigged, ship shaped, ready to sail. It's actually a nautical term for a ship that was fully rigged and ready to sail. So we have everything we need. I believe that the moment you are born again and you are placed in Christ, and I'll talk more about this in a moment, that you have at your disposal everything you need to live a life of godliness that is pleasing to the Lord. Now, why did Paul write this letter? Well, I just gave you three reasons why Paul wrote the letter, but let me mention a couple other things. Paul actually wrote the letter when he was under house arrest in Rome. Paul had two imprisonments or two main incarcerations. And the first was he ended up in Rome in the end of the book of Acts. And it was around 61, 62 AD. And the book of Acts ends with Paul in prison in Rome. But when we say in prison, he was under house arrest. So he wasn't in the Mamertine dungeon. He was in a house that he rented and people could come to visit him. He could teach and preach and minister to them. But during this time when Paul was in prison, he wrote from Rome to the believers in Colossae, about a 160 mile gap between those two locations. And so Colossians is one of what's called Paul's prison epistles. And by the way, just to mention, don't neglect the Pauline letters of the Bible. There's a dangerous trend today to focus only on the gospels of Christ and the words of Christ and teachings of Christ. And that's a wonderful thing to do. But sometimes people think, well, Paul was too doctrinal and Paul was too legalistic and Paul, Paul, Paul was kind of out there in left field. So we just want to follow Jesus and listen to Jesus and be like Jesus. And it, it, it sounds good, but Paul was an apostle by the will of God we're going to see in our text. And he was writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So he wrote with full apostolic authority and all scriptures given by what? Inspiration of God. So don't neglect because it's important that you, when you study the Bible, that you get the gospels, historical narrative, that you get the doctrinal epistles, and that you get the prophetic scriptures as well. Understanding the different types of literature in the Bible, and you don't neglect one over the other, the whole counsel of God is important. So don't neglect the Paul, Pauline epistles in your Bible. They are favorites of everyone. So during this time, he wrote Ephesians, he wrote Colossians, and he wrote Philemon. Now, just real quick before I forget, Philemon was written to a man who owned a slave in Colossae. So Philemon was from Colossae. When you read that little letter of Paul Philemon, it was written to Philemon in Colossae. Some feel that this Colossian church was the church that met in Philemon's house. And that Philemon could have been actually instrumental in actually starting the church there in Colossae. That we don't know. The Bible doesn't describe its origin or its beginnings. But he was writing from Rome, same time he wrote Philippians, and same time he wrote Ephesians, and same time he wrote Philemon. Those are the prison epistles of Paul. Much more could be said about that, but we need to move on. And uh, we also know that there was a problem in the church at Colossae. Now, just again, real quick, it's believed that the church at Colossae started while Paul, Acts 19, was in Ephesus. And if you get a map, if you've ever studied the seven churches of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, the area that those seven churches existed in modern-day Turkey, which at the Bible times was known as Asia Minor, is actually the area where Colossus, Coloss, Colossi existed. So it was about... 60 miles east of Ephesus. So I, I encourage, I didn't get a map for the screen tonight, but look at a map and check it all out. So while Paul was in Ephesus, 
In Acts 19, it says, all they that were in Asia heard the word of the Lord. So it's believed that some people, maybe uh, Philemon, maybe Epaphras, we're going to read about him in the epistle, who is believed to be the pastor, that they came to uh, Ephesus and heard Paul's preaching and teaching, were converted to Christ, and then they took the gospel back to Colossae, and the church was born. But we don't have the record in the book of Acts of the beginning of the book, or, or Paul's, uh, the, the church being started in Colossae, and Paul did not, as far as we know, actually start the church in Colossae. It was the fruit of his ministry uh, there in Asia, and no reference to it in the book of Acts. Now, why did Paul write? Because there was a crisis in the church. There were false teachers. So many of Paul's letters were written because of problems in the church. You know, sometimes you hear people say, well, you know, we just need to get back to the church of the New Testament. When the church has drifted so far, we're going get, to get, get, back, get back to the church. And which church would you like to go back to? You want, want to go back to the church at Corinth? Be like the Corinthians or the Galatians or the Colossians? They all had their problems. They all had all their issues. But God used it to bring about Paul's letters to correct the error that we are still dealing with today in our world. So the problem is, is that the epistle was written to deal with the problem then, but the problem is that it's so prevalent still yet in our world today. So it's sad that people neglect these letters because there's still false teachers in the church today. And the combination of false teaching was that they were having teaching Jewish legalism they were teaching an element of Eastern mysticism and, a, and an element of Greek philosophy. Now, I'm going to develop this background, especially when we get to chapter 2 more. But it's believed that this false teaching that came into Colossae, and it could be that maybe they came from Colossae to tell Paul about the problem. So think about it. Paul's in prison or under house arrest. He is in chains. He's never been to Colossae. It was a small church of new believers, they show up and tell Paul, there's these crazy false teachers in our church. You got to do something. So he got his pen out and he wrote this letter to take back to the believers. But it's believed that this false teaching was the beginning stages of what is known as Gnosticism. Take note of that word, Gnosticism. Gnosticism comes from the Greek word kenoskis or to know. And basically, they were people that thought that salvation was attained through a superior knowledge that could be given only to an elite group of people initiated into their club or to their group. So they believed they had a superior knowledge and that salvation was by knowledge and working your way back up to God. Now, I'm going to talk more about Gnosticism again as we go through the epistle. But they had this false concept that everything physical, all matter, was evil, and only spirit was good. So because of that, they didn't believe that God created our world. They believed that God let, that God the, let, let out these demigods, or this emanation came out from God, and eventually a God so far from the true and living God created the universe. So they didn't believe that matter was good. They thought it was evil. So because of that, they denied the incarnation of Jesus Christ. They denied that Jesus Christ had a physical body. They denied that he created the heavens and the earth or that Jesus had a physical body. So the, the Gnostic heresy that uh, they had an insufficient, inadequate, unbiblical Christ. And it's so important that our Christology, our knowledge of Christ, is accurate when it comes to understanding who Jesus Christ is. In chapter 2, verse 3, it says, In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So if you have Jesus Christ, 
You don't need anything else. And the same thing happens today. You get born again, you have Christ, you come to the Lord, and some will say, well, you need this book, or you need this particular translation, or you need this preacher, or you need this group, or you need this experience. You, you need this, or you need that, or you need the other. So the problem is that Christ is sufficient. He's all that we need. So Colossians is one of the most Christ-exalting books to show that in Christ we are complete, that he is to have preeminence, that everything we need is found in Christ. Now, I'm, I'm still warming up to my text, believe it or not, and I want to just rapid fire, I believe it'll be on the screen, give you an outline of the whole book. In chapter one, we have, we have uh, doctrine, Christ's preeminence is declared. In chapter two, we have danger, Christ's preeminence is defended. In chapter three and four, we have duty, Christ's preeminence is demonstrated. So chapter one is doctrine, Christ's preeminence declared. Chapter two, danger, Christ's preeminence defended. Chapter three and four, duty, that's the practical aspect of the book, living out Christ's preeminence demonstrated in our daily lives. Now, Ephesians focuses on Christ, a body, the church, and Colossians focuses on Christ, the head of the church. So we discover that Paul does not immediately in our text confront the crisis at Colossae, but rather begins with two things, the greeting, verses one and two, and the expression of gratitude, verses three and four. So look at it with me in your Bibles, and I encourage you to follow me in your Bibles. Starts with Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul's greeting is in verses one and two, and there are basically three things I want you to know. First of all, Paul's greeting, he gives us the ah, he, he gives us his name. We have the author, verse one, Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Now you could just stop right there, we won't do that. And we could spend the whole rest of the time together just talking about the greatness of Paul. I, I have no problems calling Paul the greatest Christian that ever lived. He was a man, he was a, a sinner that was saved by grace, but what a marvelous individual he was. And just seeing his name there, by the way, the, the name Paul means little, interesting. My middle name is Paul. It means little. He was first known as Saul. He was from Tarsus. He was the proud uh, Pharisee, no doubt, or religious leader. And uh, he was on his way to Damascus. And we know the famous story of his conversion in Acts chapter nine, when he encountered Christ on the Damascus road, was converted to Christ and became an apostle seeing Christ the, the risen Lord. So his name, Paul, his authority, apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Now, an apostle in this primary sense does not exist today. I, I don't believe that we have any apostles in the church in this sense. So what, what do I mean by this sense? These are men who had to have seen the Lord, accompanied with the Lord, saw the Lord, Paul saw him on the Damascus Road, and then they were commissioned by the Lord, and they were given the authority of the Lord. So they were, they were chosen by Christ. They saw him. They had miracles performed by them in their name. But the church's foundation was laid by the apostles, and the apostles' teachings, listen to me very carefully, are contained in the scriptures. So if you have a church or an organization that claims apostles, be very, very suspect. I'm being nice when I say that. What I should say is run for your life. <laughs> and the reason they do that is because they want to shift the authority from the apostolic New Testament 
and its writings to themselves. So they claim apostles. They don't meet the qualifications. They're self-appointed. They're not by the will of God. They can't write or speak with apostolic authority. So beware and be careful. Now, what is the secondary sense? Only in that the word apostle means sent out or one sent. It would be the equivalent of a modern day uh, ambassador. Now, when an ambassador goes from one country to, that it represents to another country, it speaks with all the authority of that country that it came from, he came from, or they came from. So we, in a sense, as his ambassadors, are, you could say, apostles, although I don't like to use that term or go there at all, we're his ambassadors. But some like to think of missionaries as having an apostolic kind of mission or ministry in that they represent Christ. But again, I don't believe that we have in the primary first sense apostles alive and still in the world today, that they've died off, they're dead and gone, but we have their writings in the New Testament which are authoritative that we must build our Christian doctrine upon. Now he had an associate with him, verse one, his name was Timothy. Timothy was the traveling companion of Paul. If you read the book of Acts, you know that Paul came to uh, Troas. Timothy had a mother who was a believer, and uh, he evidently maybe had a father who wasn't a believer, but he came to Christ, and he became a companion traveling with Paul. And uh, he, Paul wrote to him First and Second Timothy, which were pastoral epistles. It's believed that actually Timothy spent some time pastoring the church in Ephesus himself, but he was there now in Rome with Paul under house arrest as his companion. Notice he's our brother, so our brother in Christ. And then the readers of the recipients in verse two, notice in four ways that Paul characterizes them, they were saints, to the saints, and then they were called faithful brethren, they were in Christ. So they were saints, they were faithful brethren, and they were in Christ. Now, again, a key word, saints. You know, it's a tragedy that the Roman Catholic Church has elevated some people to sainthood when the Bible teaches all Christians are saints. Did you know that if you're a Christian, you're a saint? You go, no, I ain't. <laughs> you're either a saint or you ain't. Now, the word saint, the word sanctify, and the word holy all come from the same root word, which basically means to be set apart unto God. So we're set apart unto God. The word does not here convey any intrinsic holiness or necessary moral good. So it doesn't mean that you are living like a saint. It means that you are classified categorized, positioned as a saint. So the goal of the Christian life, and I gotta be careful, I don't spend too much time on this, and I hit it all the time, but it's essential, fundamental Christianity, is to bring your walk up to your position. Positionally, you are a saint. So the goal of the Christian life, and it's a lifelong process, is to become more saintly, and to walk more holy, to walk more righteously before God as the Spirit of God sanctifies the believer and we live saintly lives before God. So all this happens the moment you are born again, you are set apart unto Christ, and then the Holy Spirit starts his work of sanctification, starts with justification, and then a lifelong process of sanctification. And then when you die and you go to heaven, or the rapture of the church takes place, then you have what's called glorification, right? After throwing my back out last week, I can't wait for a new body. Can you imagine being in heaven in your new body and you go, ah, I hurt my back. No, it won't happen. Praise God for that, amen. There won't be any weakness, won't be any sin, there won't be any sickness, won't be any disease, there won't be any ERs. No hospitals, no crutches, no ambulances, no cancer, no chemotherapy, no strokes, no heart attacks, no cataracts, 
Nobody's teeth are going to fall out. Shall I keep going? So three things. Justification, I'm saved. Sanctification, I'm being saved. Glorification, I will be completely saved. I'm justified, free from sin's penalty. I'm being sanctified, free from sin's power. I will be perfectly glorified, free from sin's presence altogether. And again, what begins with grace ends in glory. So the Spirit of God convicts us, draws us, regenerates us, and dwells us, sanctifies us, and one day we will get a new body in heaven. That's something to be thankful for, amen? So all this that you are set apart as saints, and in so many of Paul's epistles, he addresses the believers Saints, this is not a select group of the Deeper Life Club. This isn't some super Christian group where the saints, all Christians are saints. Get that in your mind. Get that in your heart. Now, that's not a license to sin. That's not a license to go out and do whatever you want. The goal is to live who you are, to live out your position in Christ, knowing who you are in Christ, living out that position before a watching world. Now, they were also faithful brethren. The word faithful there in verse 2 could be translated steadfast. And the word brethren indicates that they were loved. So they were loved, steadfast brethren. This is the same people Paul just addressed as saints. They were faithful to God steadfast, and they were loved by Paul. They were brethren. And thirdly, and I've already alluded to a lot of things that could be said about this, but they were in Christ, verse 2. The reason they were saints, the reason they were brethren, is because they were in Christ. Now, everyone who's born again, saved, is a saint. And the minute you're a saint, you're in the body of Christ. The minute you're in the body of Christ, you're a brother or sister in, in Christ. And all of it is because you are all placed together as believers we are in Christ or in Christ Jesus. This phrase, in Christ, is used by Paul in his epistles more than any other expression. So if you don't understand it, give special attention and focus to understanding what it means that I am in Christ. It will totally revolutionize and transform your spiritual life. When the light goes on and you understand what it means to be in Christ. I, I grew up in church, came to Christ at an early age, kind of fell away, got a little prodigal during my high school years, came to Christ right after I graduated from high school, back to Christ. And I, I grew up in a church that never taught this or explained this or understood this. And this is why the Christians I knew struggled. And many of them thought every week they lost their salvation. And every week they had to get saved again. And they thought that God didn't love them or didn't like them or didn't, 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 didn't care for them. They didn't, they didn't know that they were in Christ and what a marvelous concept this is. And this is, these are things that are true, by the way, of every Christian, no matter how long you've been saved, no matter how holy they live, they're in Christ. Now, again, this freaks some people out. Some people can't quite digest this. But if you're saved, period, you're in Christ. If you're not saved, you're not in Christ. If you're not in Christ, you're not saved. They are one and the same. If you're in Christ, you're in the church. If you're in the church, you're going to get raptured. That's the issue. So it just opens up a whole area of understanding. In Ephesians chapter 1, we're blessed in Christ. In Colossians 2 verse 10, we're complete in Christ. In Romans chapter 1 verse 8, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In Romans 8 verse 39, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And the list could go on and on and on and on. Now let me ask... Three, three quick questions before I move on. 
How do you get in Christ? By being born again. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13 says, we've all been baptized by one spirit into one body. We've all been made to drink of one spirit. Every Christian has been baptized by the spirit taken out of Adam and placed in Christ. Now, before you were born again, you were in who? Adam. Not good. Sin, death, condemnation. Everyone outside of Christ is in all of humanity in two federal heads, Adam or Christ. So this is when you are saved, you're taken out of Adam and placed in Christ. And then when do you get in Christ? The moment you are regenerated by the Holy Spirit. They're one and the same. And let me make, make, make mention of this. It's not necessarily a physical or emotional experience other than your sins are forgiven, you become a Christian, you sense his peace, but you don't, you don't, you don't have an experience to go, whoa, I just got taken out of Adam. I just felt it. Whew, out of Adam in Christ. Ooh, that was awesome. Oh no, out of Christ back in Adam. There is absolutely no teaching or text or scripture in the Bible that indicates that once you are in Christ, you can never get out of Christ. Now, I know that there are Christians, I was one of them for some time years ago, that believe that, I no longer believe that. From my study of God's word, especially the book of Romans, and we're working on a book actually in Romans chapter eight right now called Blessed Assurance. That once in Christ, always in Christ. Once in Christ, always. For, do you, for you to lose your salvation, there's a whole list of things that would have to happen. One of them is you'd have to be taken out of Christ and put back in Adam. You didn't put yourself in Christ. How do you get yourself out of Christ? Once in Christ, always in Christ. Now, that's not a license to sin. That's a motivation to live a holy life, a godly life. And here's my third question. How long is a person in Christ? I guess I've already answered that question. Once in Christ, always in Christ. Read Romans chapter 8. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then reference to them being in Colossae in verse 2. And we already talked about the city and the founding of the church. And then there's the blessing, verse 2, Grace, which is the Greek word keros, which has the concept of beautiful and charming and gracious and also unmerited favor, be unto you and peace from God our Father, which is the Hebrew concept of shalom. And it always comes in this order. Grace precedes peace. You can't experience the peace of God until you experience the grace of God. Once you come to experience God's grace, then you can experience the peace of God in your soul. So salvation is peace with God. Sanctification is the peace of God. Grace and peace. And it's from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And you could add Galatians 5.22. It also comes from God the Holy Spirit. So we're saved by grace. We stand in God's grace, and we experience God's marvelous peace. Now, the second section, and we won't tarry, is verse 3 to 5, Paul's gratitude. So his greeting, verses 1 and 2, to his gratitude. Follow with me again in your Bible. We give thanks, and we do this to God the Father, or to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints. For verse 5, the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, wherever you heard before the word of truth, the gospel. Now notice, we're thankful for your faith, for your love, and for your hope. Those three, that triad of the Christian life, your faith, your hope, and your love. Now, remember Paul was writing from where? In prison, right? 
house arrest, but prison, he was in chains. The church in Colossae was facing danger of false teachers, and yet Paul had a thankful heart. Oh, I, I wish I could be more like Paul in this area. I'm in prison, church has got false teachers, and I'm thankful. That's, that's an amazing thought, because he was so stayed on Christ, he knew that he was the head of the church and that he was in control. So even with this adverse situation that Paul was in, he still had a thankful heart. It's a dominant theme in the book of Colossians. Let me point them out real quickly. We have here in chapter 1, verse 3, I mentioned being grateful or thankful. But peak actually in chapter 1, verse 12, he says, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Then jump down to chapter 2 and verse 7. In verse 7 of chapter 2, rooted and built up in, the, in him, established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. And then look at chapter 3, verse 15 for just a moment. Chapter 3, verse 15, he says, And let the peace of God, which rules in our hearts, to which you're also called, into one body, and be ye thankful. And then jump down, chapter 3, verse 17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to him by the, giving thanks to God, excuse me, and the Father by him. And then peek at chapter 4 and verse 2. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. So I, 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 I never really realized that Colossians had so much reference to thanksgiving, a thankful heart, gratitude. And that's what happens when we get our minds upon the Lord. Amen? You may have been maybe discouraged or maybe uh, depressed because your mind has been on other things than Christ. If you want to get really depressed, just go home and spend some time looking in the mirror. Depression will sit in. Think about your problems, how people are treating you, your problems, and all your issues, and you just get depressed. Cast your cares upon the Lord, turn to him in prayer, look to him, and you'll be blessed. Amen? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will go strangely dim in light of his glory and grace. Amen? So the book of Colossians has a grateful heart of Paul displayed for us, Paul's gratitude. Now, notice Paul's attitude of gratitude, we give thanks, is in the present tense, back in verse 3 of chapter 1. It means we are continually, habitually, ongoingly giving thanks. And it's a thankfulness that was a part of his prayers. So when he prayed, he didn't just petition he had thanksgiving in his prayers, even when he was in chains. And he was praying, what? For you, always for you. This is an interesting Greek phrase. It has the idea of literally around you. So for you, or surround you, or we're surrounding you with prayers. It was a comfort to me this past week when I was laid up with this injury of my back to get the text and the messages, Pastor John, we're praying for you. To be surrounded and held up by prayer was such a blessing. So Paul's thankful heart as he prayed for them. Now there are three things, as I pointed out, he prayed for, he was thankful for, their faith, their love, and their hope. Notice in verse four, for your faith, and notice that their faith was in Christ Jesus. Now, that phrase, for your faith, is literally for the faith of you. Their faith was real, their faith was practical, and most importantly, notice their faith has at its object, Christ. So you need to make sure that your faith is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, right? I'll stop there. I'll be quoting hymns all night. 
I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but holy lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all of their ground is sinking sand. What your faith has as an object is the important issue. Not the amount of your faith, the object of your faith. A little faith in Christ will take your soul to heaven. A lot of faith will bring heaven to your soul. But you'll, you, 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 you just take a little faith in a great God to be in heaven. So the Christian life is the life of faith, and they were living their faith. Are you living by faith or by feeling or emotions? And then their love, and notice verse 4, and of the love to which you have for all the saints. Now notice all the saints, not just the ones you like. Even the ones that irritate you or bother you. You love all the saints. That's, that's hard. That's not easy to do. Faith in God and love for God's children always go together. You cannot say, I'm a Christian. I trusted Christ. I believe in God, but I don't like Christians. Or, I'm a Christian, but not one of those loving kind. I'm a grumpy Christian. Jesus said that in John's gospel, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, that you have what? Love one for another. It's the birthmark of a, of a true believer, love. 1 John chapter 3, verse 23, and this is the commandment, that we should believe on the name of the Son of Je on, his son, on his Son, excuse me, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us Commandments, And by the way, that word love there is the Greek word agope. It's God's spiritual divine love. And it's to all the saints. And then their hope, I love this, verse 5. Their faith, their love, and their hope. Now this hope in verse 5 is laid up for you, that's the believers, the saints, where? In heaven. And they heard about this before when they heard the word of truth, which was the gospel, which brought about their salvation. So this is talking about their hope of heaven. When you become a Christian, you have a hope in your heart that prior to your salvation, you didn't have. People that are not in Christ have no hope of heaven. Christians have the hope of heaven. This is why we can endure the sufferings, the physical infirmities, the weaknesses of our flesh, the adversities, the trials, the hardships, because I'm going to heaven, amen? It's perfectly legitimate, and I would say biblical, to be heavenly minded. And the more heavenly minded, the more earthly good. The more earthly minded, the less heavenly good to realize I'm headed to heaven and that I have a hope beyond the grave. Christian hope is a steadfast assurance. That phrase laid up literally means kept or secure. It has the idea of fixed or fastened as to not give way or to let loose or be lost. It's for you in heaven. Jesus said in John 14, what did he say? He said, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I, if you believe in God, believe also in me. There's the object of your faith. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it weren't so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place, and if I go to prepare a place, I will do what? Come back again. Receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in a person, believe in a place, believe in a promise. I'm going to heaven. And all this is in the hope of the gospel. Verse 5. It says there, you heard it, the word of truth, the gospel. Now we'll start here next session. The gospel message is that which joins the hope in the heart of the hope of heaven. It must be preached Ye heard before, it's the gospel that is true. It's the word of truth, verse 5, and it centers in Christ. 
The gospel is that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures, that Jesus rose again from the dead according to the scriptures. Amen? So believers have faith. We look to God. We have love. We look out toward others. We have hope. We look to heaven. Jesus is coming to take us to the Father's house. Amen?